Daniel chapter number 3. Daniel chapter number 3. I will review and uh, get us uh, to where we were. And uh, while you're turning there, uh, as everyone knows, next weekend is the 4th of July weekend. We will have a full schedule. Uh, there's no need to change anything, to cancel anything. Uh, the 4th is on Monday. Yes, we're going to have a considerable amount of people going on vacation, but that's, uh, uh, that's to be expected in the summertime that we are going to have some Sundays that are going to be low. But, you know, but no, we're not going to cancel anything. So if you're not traveling, uh, we'll do a full schedule. Let me uh, get us current where we were since I missed, and, and I think that in two weeks we may well have uh, forgotten where we were. And really, all I did was the introduction to Daniel chapter number three, and I'm going to go very quickly through the first seven verses again to get us current. Before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. And Brother Tuggle, would you pray for us, please? Amen. Father, thank you once again for today for giving us an opportunity to come to your house and worship you. We thank you for these conferences. Here today, Father, we just ask you to bless this one that came today that sets out of here for life to come. Honor you and just worship the earth. We thank you for the business meeting. And it's smooth. Church handle business. In a nice smooth way. We appreciate this church. People here appreciate Brother George's leadership of this church. We just ask him to bless him as he leads the church. Help us to be submissive, Father, to your will. Do your will in our daily lives. And thank you again, most of all, for Jesus who came and gave me life and covered and we can have life everlasting. We pray for those who have been mentioned today, Father, who are sick, afflicted, recovered from surgery. Those that have special needs, we just pray. You heal them, Father, part of your will. That's the best message this afternoon. Just for the George, as he presents your word. Thank you, Ask all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Kenneth. Never, Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar the king made the image of gold. Nebuchadnezzar would be the first Gentile world ruler who is also a type of the last Gentile world ruler yet to come the Antichrist who will also have his people make a large image of himself Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold false religion is always gaudy and spectacular You'll think about that. False religion is always large, loud, gaudy, and spectacular. Why? Because it isn't real. So it has to be, what is that word they're saying? Image. An imitation of the real thing. Real Christians while we appreciate the final things of life, our Christianity, our faith, does not depend on the finer things of life. We don't need uh, Gothic buildings. We don't need uh, $5,000 crystal chandeliers. If we have them, okay. If we don't have them, okay. Real Christian people who worship the Lord in spirit and in truth can worship in a plain building. And if it burns down this week, if lightning gets it, we'll figure out somewhere to put some chairs and go on. We are not destroyed if the physical side of our life is destroyed such a simple statement that makes such a loud statement. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, 90 feet, th uh, three square cubits, 90 feet, the breadth almost 10 feet. 
He set up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Nobody knows where Dura, Dura is. There are three places today named Dura in the Middle East. Uh, none of those would be this place. We don't know where this place was. Obviously, it had to be close enough to Babylon to be accessible by everybody. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather together. This was a effort at unification of the kingdom. The Bible does not say what was going on in the kingdom that uh, Nebuchadnezzar felt the need to do this, but obviously there was a need he felt that we needed to unify the, the kingdom. And then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent together together. I want you to notice the organization, the high degree of organization of his kingdom. We're not talking about folks running around in, uh, in sheepskin with belly clubs before the inventing of the wheel. We're, that, that's not, we're talking about a high order of civilization and government. The princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces. Highly organized to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Now, you immediately have a problem for the Jewish people in this kingdom. And all through this kingdom, and then all through the next one, Media, Persia, Media, Persia, all through the next one, uh, Greek, the Greek, all through the next one, uh, the Roman Empire, which still exists in these various little ten-toe segments, what God was doing was protecting His people. God's program never was what these kingdoms' programs were. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. This would be the first worldwide Gentile ruler-led effort at one world religion. And of course it failed just like the one effort yet to come will fail. The folks in the pew may not be as much aware of it as those of us that are in the pulpit are aware of the fact that effort is alive and well today. We are talked down to and we are belittled. We are being called uh, narrow-minded for not being a part of the uh, ministerial alliance of E. Rice County or the, uh, the, the Council of World Churches which by the way years ago have set up and voted on a constitution and bylaws for a one world church I'm talking about 2016 here I'm not talking about 607 BC <coughs> There are a lot of things that have changed, but some things have not changed. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded. Now, no human being, I don't care what point of government they may be, and no human being has the right to command anybody what to worship. We as Bible-believing Christians, we as Baptists, we as independent Baptists, reject the notion at any level, high or low, to tell us how and when to worship. We worship Yahweh, Jehovah God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We worship in spirit and in truth. By the way, even I don't have the right to command you how to worship. I lead you. I'll do my best to properly teach you the Bible. But no organization uh, has any right 
on you individually or on, on us as a church to tell us who and how and when we are to worship. Our modern seminaries and so many of the modern teachers and so many of the young men that come out of modern seminaries have forgotten the heavy price that Baptists through the years have had to pay for their separatist stand. By a separatist stand, I mean that we operate under God, not under God and some man-made organization. And it has cost us persecution through the years. Then and Herod commanded, O oh people, nations, I want you to notice people, nation, languages. This is an effort at worldwide unification of one world religion. And this will happen again in end time events. One world government, one world religion. That at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sacba, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music. Not pretty music. I have no way, because some of these instruments that are hard to describe, I have no way to really give you a good description. And I certainly don't have any way to bring a CD machine in here and put a CD in it. But it's not, it's not pretty music. It's irritating. It's out of time. It's double time. It's real Christian music. Is gentle, sweet, easy to listen to, calming, godless music, even in religious circles, is loud, obnoxious, irritating. It, it grades on your nerves. Uh, we as Baptists, and especially as independent Baptists, have largely resisted. And I will, until the day the Lord takes me home or the church tells me to get lost. I'm going to resist. We're not going to have bands in here. That's my personal conviction. You brought me in to lead your church. So I will leave the church in that our music is going to stay like it is. I'm not against lively music. I love what Brother Lane did this morning. Yeah. But a music really is a reflection of the theology of a people. And usually uh, you know, it's a funny thing that in, in all third world countries, everybody knows drums are used to call up the demons. Anybody can do a little checking and verify the statement I just made. So the result of that is supposed to be you fall down and worship. Uh, the American churches largely are going to what is called praise and worship services. And what that means is you've got a praise team or a worship team or you got guitars and you got drums and, and they carry on for 30 minutes and it's supposed to get you in the mood to worship. Now I've been in enough of those services to be able to tell you this on authority. There's nothing about that stuff that makes you in the mood to worship. It makes you get tired and want to snap. <coughs> Folks, you'll never replace the great hymns of the faith. Amen. He's not going to do it. Now, I understand you get ten preachers up there, nine of them are going to disagree with me. I can't help that. I think that when I hear the music of the bars when I was a little boy in Cleveland, Ohio, and Detroit Street on the south and Franklin Street on the north of us, where all the bars were 
You know, I heard the music coming out of that, and today I hear that same sound in the church. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. I won't buy it. And if somebody turns me out to pasture someday for being an old fuddy-duddy, all right. But I'm not buying it. We must worship God in spirit and in truth. And it takes a certain sound for the Holy Spirit to work. And it's not the sound of the world. Amen. Worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Now, there are consequences for going against the world. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Christianity always has been. Worship of the true God always has been. Is today and always will be till Jesus comes the most persecuted thing on, on earth. I hope you counted the cost when you signed up with the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, of course, was a particular affront to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and any other Jewish people who were leaders in the kingdom. They knew Exodus 20, verse 1 through 5. They knew Deuteronomy chapter number 5. They knew that God forbid such a thing, and so they would not do it. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackcloth, psaltery, all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. So, the Jews now have a problem. Just like Christians today now have a problem resisting the modern worldly ways that are being brought into the churches as tools of worship. And sooner or later, there will be consequences. Now I want you to see something in verse number 8 and 9, and that's obviously where we're going to stop because we're pushing to third already. Wherefore, in other words, as a consequence of this attempt at world uh, uh, religious uniting and the Jewish, the true believers, uh, the true worshipers of Yahweh could not do this. There were going to be consequences. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Now, I want you to just lock in on that statement there. Accused the Jews. Let me ask you a question. Who do we accuse? Who does the law accuse? The innocent or the guilty? Who does the law accuse? A man who's driving down the road, going the speed limit, or here's some guy going down the road at 50 mile an hour over the speed limit. Who is the law going to accuse? The guy going 50 miles over the speed limit. The very scenario is wrong. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came here and accused. They had done anything wrong. They had not done anything to be accused by the government of. But that's the world we live in. And folks, you're seeing it in America more and more and more. The guilty are treated as though they had done anything wrong. The folks that are right are being accused of being narrow-minded and unloving and bigoted and wrong. We're seeing more and more watch the news. Uh, 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 the right are being accused of being wrong. And the wrong are being mollified, qualified. That very statement ought to just make bells go off in your head. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldean came here and accused the Jews. Christians today are being accused. We happen to live in the Bible Belt. We happen so far by the grace of God to be very well sheltered from it. 
But we, we have arrived at that time in our own culture and in our own civilizations that Christians are being accused. And the young preachers that are coming up, my heart goes out to the young <coughs> preachers coming up because uh, I know God really had a very easy birth, relatively speaking, but the young men like Brother Lane and others that are now coming up, God only knows what price they'll have to pay for standing up for the truth. The right are accused. The wrong are being commended. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. And then comes the accusation, the mock trial. The young men stand for their Bible convictions and they're cast into the fire where the Lord is with them and brings them out. And even the king and all of his godless host had to admit the Lord God is the true God. As I have already shared with you, and we'll go into it in a little more detail next week. This is a picture of the Jews in the great tribulation yet to come. So while we are studying an event that took place, place 2,500 or more years ago, it actually is a prophecy of what is yet to come. So, that's where we'll stop. And we'll explain it, and Lord willing, we'll finish chapter 3 next Sunday afternoon.